Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, is how he starts. And, uh, you know, we think, wow, I wish I could be like that. And then you get uh, into about chapter two and three, and he's had seven days to think about it. And you get into chapter three and he starts saying things like God's a meaning. <laughs> And well, it would have been better for me. You're going to see he's going to repeat that same argument now when he gets into chapter 9 and 10. He's going to make that exact same argument. It would have been better if I was never born than that I should have all these problems. And we think to ourselves, what happened to that guy in chapter 1 and 2 when he was being so nice? Well, remember we said whenever you have a situation like this, a traumatic um, incident in your life it is not unusual for us to be in shock at first and being in shock we don't realize maybe sometimes the magnitude of things and being in shock we sort of our uh, brain is kind of protected from all that we're really going through and uh, we don't really know how bad it is and so uh, after we've been in that problem for a while, then things begin to soak in and we begin to see how bad it really, really is. And uh, then we have that uh, time of mourning. And Job now was in that long period of mourning. And mourning, remember, can take uh, easily up to two years. He had just lost his kids. I think when we look at Job sometimes, it's so easy for us to forget the magnitude of his problem. He lost 10 children. Now, of course, uh, we as a family uh, suffered for a moment that same thing. Uh, when uh, 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 Naya was born, uh, oh, joy to the world. And then all of a sudden, within a few minutes, they're weighing her and she stops breathing. And without saying a word to Nathaniel or to Christine, the nurses rushed the baby out of the room. And Nathan, how long was it, like a half hour before you, about, so for a half hour, he doesn't know what happened to his child. The last thing he saw was the words or heard was she's not breathing. Like Job, for that moment now, Nathaniel is, and his wife, we didn't know anything. Mom and I are just sitting in the waiting room. We don't know anything because the last we knew, Nathaniel was going in. The baby's coming, the baby's coming, and, and everything was looking good. And then all of a sudden, uh, Nathaniel's standing there by himself. They're rushing his baby out the door saying, she's not breathing, she's not breathing. And for that half hour, Nathaniel didn't know if his little baby was alive or not. Now, we have to remember, and, and I'm sure, see, the shock of all of that hadn't quite set in, but you can imagine what terror that must have been for Uncle Nano and for Auntie Christine to think that they just lost that baby. Now, Job is going through that, and he's been going through that now for over seven days. He has lost his children, all ten of them. And he has got to be absolutely devastated unless you've been a parent and unless you've lost a child. I think you cannot even begin to comprehend the depth of this man's sorrows. And uh, so, of course, he's there. He's at the city dump. Some of his friends have begun to gather around him. For seven days, his friends, the most wisdom they ever showed was for seven days they said absolutely nothing. But of course, after seven days, all they did was weep with him and sit there with him. He's at the city dump. They stayed at the city dump. He was pouring ashes over his body. They poured ashes over their body. And uh, they tried to uh, emulate or simulate uh, what he was going through best they could. Finally, we remember in chapter 3, at the end of his seven days, he began to complain. And after he complained, one of his friends stood up and said, let me explain why you don't have a reason to complain. <laughs> and then he argued with that friend. And that took us through uh, chapter 6 and 7 uh, last week. And so now we're into chapter 8 and another friend. And uh, for those of you who love your Uncle Bill, this is one of his favorite jokes. Who's the shortest man in the Bible? Bill Dab the shoe height. And here we have in chapter 8 in the beginning. Then answered Bill Dab the shoe height. 
The, of course, then his second sponsor was, well, there was a man shorter than that. If you remember the Philippian jailer who slept on his watch. <laughs> so, as an ode to your Uncle Bill, I give you those jokes. And uh, so here we have Bildad the shoe height now. He is a picture, really, of uh, what we would call a dogmatic person. A dogmatic person is the person who knows he's always right. Uh, the dogmatic person is the person who says, this is the way it's done. And he's going to argue his dogmatism, if you would, from a standpoint of tradition. He's going to say, look back. Look at your past. Look at your relatives, look at history, and history will teach us certain things. And so his dogmatism is, and it's the same argument throughout the whole thing. The same thing that his last friend Elihu said was, Job, you need to repent. And Job says, I got nothing to repent of, I did nothing wrong. Now look at what Bildab is going to make his argument. He begins by saying to uh, J uh, um, Job here in chapter 8, How long will you speak these things? Looking back, remember, uh, he has gone all the way through chapter 6 and 7 making his argument. And so he finally says, after this two chapters of argument, why, he said, when are you going to stop talking like this? How long are you going to speak these words? They are the words like a strong wind. Um, your words are a blustering wind is the way I put it up there. You know, you're just a bag of hot air. Is what Now, what kind of a friend? Here this man has just lost his wife, or his kids, not his wife, lost his kids, lost his house, lost his money, lost everything. And he's complaining about God. And Bildab says, I got to tell you something. You're just a hot bag of wind. How long are you going to keep talking like this? Because again, you are perverting judgment. The justice of the Almighty, he says. He is going to make the same argument that everybody else so far has made. He's going to say to Job, all you need to do is repent and let God restore repent and let God restore confess your sins in the first day uh, seven verses is what he was saying you know hey listen uh, if you were pure and upright surely now he would awake for thee and make thy habitation of the righteous prosperous listen if you were as righteous as you say then God would stand up and take your defense right now Remember, this goes from the argument that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And God being good, the secular idea, and that's what Bildeb is arguing, a secular idea, a good God would only do good things for people. How often do we hear people say that? Well, if God is so great, then why do all these bad things happen? Because a good God would only let good things happen happen in the world. And so Bildab begins his argument about it, uh, dropping down through verses 8 through 19. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age. Look at history and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. For we are but as yesterday and know nothing because our days upon earth are a shadow. Listen, if we look at the past, won't it teach us, he's going to continue on to say. Won't we learn something if we were to look? Continue, because he says to this, I got to tell you, as you go through his argument, he comes down to one thing. Godless people die. Look at verse 13. He's going to make this. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrites hope shall perish. The green grass for good people, the furnace for the dead grass, and for wicked people. It, the godless people will die. That's his whole argument in 9 through 19. Godless people die. Now you're going to see Job is going to make the same argument you just thought to yourself in just a moment. Wait, everybody dies. 
the good and the bad. Job's going to make this argument. But in Bildab's argument, the godless people will all die. Well, that's true. But it is also true that everybody will die. This is again his argument as he looks at history. I don't care how far back you go in history. History is the record of life and death. Life and death. Once a generation comes up, and when my generation was born, we gave birth to the second generation, and someday we'll pass on. And then the third generation is here, and they will continue. And that's just the way life is. But he talks about the reward that God gives down in verse 20 through 22. He talks about what God is going to give for righteous people. He advises Job, therefore, to repent. Look at verse 20 through 22 with me. He says, Behold, God will not cast away perfect man, neither will he help evildoers. God will do good stuff for good people. If you are perfect, God will do stuff for you. Well, guess what? I don't think there's anybody in this room that God's going to do anything for because none of us are perfect. If that's our argument, if that's our choice. And so if you're perfect, of course God's going to take care of you. So Bildab, if God takes care of perfect people, guess what you are not? Because you've got problems. So he's going to conclude... Till he fills thy mouth with laughter and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Listen, God takes care. You know, if you're a good guy, your life is going to be one of joy and laughter and everybody's going to look at you and say, wow, what a wonderful life that guy had. He did nothing but enjoy his life. He had fun all the way through it. But if you've got some sin in your life, whoa, you ought to expect some trouble. And, and our concern is we so often think these same thoughts. When something bad happens in our life, the first thing we say to ourselves is, oh, God's mad at me because I must have done something. And the truth of the matter is, if that were true, God's always mad at us because we've always done something. But the Bible promises that our sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. So Bildab now has made his argument, Joe, you're a big bag of wind. The godless are going to die and God's going to reward the righteous. So therefore, repent and turn to God. But Job's going to make his own argument here in just a second. He's going to argue, first of all, and this, I think, the whole purpose for the book of Job comes down to number three. I think Job, remember, you go through the problems you go through never for yourself. You always go through problems for the sake of someone else. The things that I have suffered in my life, and Michael alluded to this on Sunday, was so that this generation or this group of people or my children would learn from my mistakes or they would learn from my problems and how dad overcame them. We look back and we say, well, how did grandma overcome? How did grandpa overcome? How did dad overcome? And we take a look at those things and we realize that we can walk this path. But Job's got some arguments of his own. He says to his friend, here's my first problem. And uh, he's going to answer it. Take a look at uh, chapter 9 and look at verses 2 and 3. Job answers and says, I know it is true. But how should a man be just with God? See, he's asking good questions. And every one of these, Jesus is going to answer he will contend with him. You cannot answer God one out of a thousand questions. If God was to ask you, you wouldn't be able to answer one out of a thousand. If God was to ask you a thousand questions, you couldn't answer them. Why? Because we don't understand like he does. So he comes up with, first of all, how can a mortal man argue with an immortal God? You can't argue with God because you don't have his mind. God's got us on an unfair advantage. 
If my granddaughters, very pretty as they are, wanted to argue with grandpa, I guarantee I could win every single argument with them. Because grandpa is old. And grandpa has argued a lot in his life. So I could probably, on an argumentative base, beat my granddaughters. Now my grandsons back there, I don't know, they're all smart and intelligent and grown up and old already. They could probably whittle me down after a while. But I could probably hold, I tell you, Cody's don't stand a chance. I could beat her in an argument hands down just like that. And that's what Job is saying. If you were to take this child and compare her intellect, if you would, to mine, you'd say, well, it's an easy defeat. And Job says, well, how can I argue with God? God is infinitely wise. God has probably thought and argued every possible question in the universe. God is the one who creates questions in men's minds. How could we possibly argue with God? That I'm at a disadvantage, he says to Bildab. I wouldn't begin to argue with God because I don't know how. That's why we very rarely argue with God. We just sort of always accuse God. You ever notice we just always blame him? We never ask God. We just assume he's wrong and tell him that. Because we know we can't argue with him. We know if I was to say to God, why did you let this happen to me? He'd probably give me a very good answer. And I'd have to say, oh, I deserve it. I don't want to say I deserve it. I want God to come and apologize to me. God did this to me. He owes me an apology. And I'm going to stand here till he apologizes because I'm right. And God says, I ain't apologize to nobody, no how ever. I tell you what, I ain't even going to tell you why I'm doing it to you. And that's where he gets to a joke. I'm not even going to tell you why. I'm not even going to tell you why. There's probably hundreds and hundreds of reasons why God let that little baby girl stop breathing. And there's probably hundreds and hundreds more reasons why he let her stop breathing last night. We will never begin to comprehend them all. And so God can't give us an answer because there may be hundreds of answers. But we just like one. But how can you argue? How can a mortal, how can somebody with a finite mind argue with an infinite God? That's his argument. He's frustrated. He's innocent and he knows he's innocent. But how do you argue with God that I'm innocent? How do you tell God I didn't do anything wrong? Because the moment you say that you know your own conscience is going to convict you, you can't honestly, and this is Job's problem. He's saying, well, I know in this particular matter I didn't do anything wrong. But to say to God I don't deserve this because I've never done anything wrong, he said, right away, my own heart's convicting me. Because you can't look at God and say, I've never. My mom, when she would whack us and she'd realize she whacked me for the wrong reason, she'd say, well, that's for the one that you didn't get caught with. You know, She would never say she was wrong to whack you. She would just say, well, maybe this wasn't the one, but I know you got away with something and that's for the time you got away with it. And that's why she was whacking you now. And so God could say the same thing. Well, this one isn't for now. This is for the one you did 30 years ago. I just remembered it. And so how do you argue? And so he continues his argument. Now remember what Bildab said. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Bildab says that God destroys the wicked. But look here in verses 15 through 31. Look at what Job says. Job says, I don't think he just destroys the wicked. In fact, I know he doesn't, he's going to argue to you and to me. He is going to say, because, look at verse 22. There is one thing, therefore I said it. He destroys the perfect and the wicked. All right, you made me say it. I didn't want to. But you brought it up. So let me just remind you, God doesn't only destroy bad people. You ever notice that all the good people are gone too? All right, sure, Cain is gone. But hey, Abel's not with us either. Cain might be gone, but Seth is also gone. Hey, remember that wicked generation that Noah was found perfect in? 
Yeah, that wicked generation was all gone. But where's Noah today? He's gone too. He eventually died as well. All of the wicked people, all granted, wicked people die. But you tell me one righteous person that is still alive today from that age. Methuselah, longest living man. But where is he today? He's in the ground. You go back through Genesis and everybody's life, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, and then it always ends with, and he died. And he died. And he died. So yes, God destroys the wicked, but he also destroys the just. So I can't argue with God. Because here's a God who will take out good and bad the same way. He don't care. You think everybody was as evil as everybody else in the flood? Maybe there were some people who did small sins and some people did big sins. But God took out everybody. And so this is his argument here. God destroys both the good and the bad. But he's going to continue to you and to me. And look at verse 33. When you get down to 32 to 35, I think you hit the whole thing. Job says, if only, if only there were a mediator. That word mediator there in the Hebrew, of course, is the word umpire. Somebody who can put his hands on both parties. Now, when you get to the New Testament, here's the joy of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, there is a mediator. Jesus Christ the righteous. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I think it's verse 5. Paul plainly declares, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We are in a much better situation than Job was because Job didn't have a mediator. See, you and I, it's hard for us to understand what these Old Testament saints went through because they didn't know God like we did. They didn't have the opportunity. If just everything to them was a mystery, when you read, you look at their lives, and their lives are so physical. All of their prayers are about this life. They're all about give me money, give me money, give me longer lives, give me money. You get to the New Testament, and Paul says, when you pray, pray like this. Lord, build your church. Lord, keep us brave. Lord, don't let us quit just because persecution is coming. Nobody asks for money in the New Testament. Nobody asks for longer life in the New Testament. They ask, Lord, don't let me quit. Don't let me quit. Don't let me quit. Lord, keep the church going. Lord, we're facing persecution. Help us to stay strong. Help us to stay strong. They never say, Lord, sure would be nice if you gave me $100. You don't read it. You don't read it. We have an advantage. We've got a mediator. Job says, if only I had somebody who could argue with God. Now here's the problem. If you're going to argue with God, who do you have to be to argue with God? You have to be God. Because you have to have somebody who is equally, in order to be a mediator, in order to be an umpire, you've got to be able to equally agree with this person and this person. An umpire in a game is not supposed to be biased. You can't go in there and say, oh boy, I'm doing the Bengals and the Tigers game. And I should open the Tigers game. You can't, so you can't go in and say, like, okay, uh, Rams are playing Green Bay. And as the umpire, I'm thinking before the game, the Rams might win this. What did I do? Right away, I'm siding with one team. In order to be a fair umpire, I can't have anything in the game. I can't want one side to win over the other. Right? So Jesus, when he stands next to us as our advocate, as our mediator, he has gone to want what God wants as equally as he wants what I want. And that's what makes him unique. And so this is the prayer of Job. If only there were a mediator. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, guess what? I am your advocate with the Father. I will stand in your place. And so you go to John chapter 17. 
the great high priestly prayer where he's in the garden and he's praying for you and for me. Read John chapter 17 where Jesus specifically prays for you. And it's quite amazing. He prays not only for us as individuals, but for our church as well. And that's where I put my rest. If only Job says there was a mediator. And of course, Jesus comes back and says, guess what? So I'm glad Job thought that thought. Because it's written down. And guess what? You and I can point to it now and say, we do. We do. Look at chapter 10, though. He continues his argument. And he begins to say, and this again, we have seen this before. Look at verse 2. And I would say to God, if I had a mediator, if I had somebody who could take me into God's throne room and stand there with me so God wouldn't kill me, somebody who could defend me from God, somebody who could protect me, I would say to God, don't condemn me. Show me where thou contend with me. Show me why you're doing this to me. Show me why you think I deserve this. <coughs> if I had a mediator, I'd go to God and say, why are you picking on me? And make God answer me. See, that's what we do with a lawyer. We take our lawyer and the lawyer, we say, okay, let's ask him this uh, tough, tough question. Why are you treating me so terribly? Of all the people in the world, I'm probably one of the good guys. There are a bunch of bad people in the world. I mean, I live here in Ontario. I'm supposing there's 107,000 people or 170,000 people in our city. Of 170,000, probably 160,000 of them are worse than me. So why has God got to pick on me? What did I do wrong? Go pick on real bad people. Aren't there real bad people in the world? Aren't there murderers? Aren't there terrorists? Aren't there gangsters? Aren't there all those bad people? Can't God go and pick on them for a change? Why me? Why is God going to pick on my little white car when there's all these other white cars out there that he can be picking on? If I had an advocate, that's what I'd go and ask God. That's what Job is saying here. But I think if you had a real good lawyer, he'd probably say to you, you know, that's not a real good question to ask. Because you're guilty. It's like the, the fellow who said, God, give me justice. God, give me justice. God, give me justice. And somebody else in the congregation stood up and prayed, Lord, don't give us justice. Give us mercy. Give us mercy. See, at the cross, I didn't get justice. At the cross, I got mercy. And let me tell you, mercy helped me a whole lot more than justice. If I had gotten justice, I'd be burning in hell today. Because I'm a sinner. But I'm sure glad that mercy is what was poured out on the cross. I'm glad Jesus said, Father, forgive Terry, for he doesn't even know what he's doing. Hey, temporary insanity. I'll take that plea. I don't know. I have the mental acuity. I don't have the spiritual awareness. I don't know God the way I should. And so I didn't understand that my sin was wrong at that particular point. But as I have studied and read the Bible, of course, now I am more guilty than ever before because I know better. And I'm still just as lousy a person as I was to begin with. And then he moves on, as we've seen before, to his pity party. Lord, why did you create me? Did you make me just to condemn me? You created David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Why did you make me? Just so you could pick on me? Did you have nothing else to do with all the people in the world? There are billions of people in this world. You had to specifically make me just so you could pick on me? You couldn't make other people to pick on and love me? You had to make me just so you could condemn me? Why did you do that, God? Why did you make me just to kill me? Of course, you know, God in his argument and Jesus in his argument made it very plain that God created the Pharaoh only to prove his power. So God does have a right. Remember the potter and the clay? 
Does the clay have the right to say to the potter, why made me thus? Paul would argue. See, Paul has probably read Job. Because Paul went through a lot of problems his own. Shipwrecked this many times. When you read Paul's life, he's always saying, God picked on me a lot. A lot. I was shipwrecked more than anybody else. I was beaten with stripes more than anybody else. I was persecuted. I was this. I was beaten. I was that. I was robbed. I, you name it. <coughs> Paul said, and I had that problem. So Paul could say this. But then Paul adds in there that God made the Pharaoh just to show his power. And then he says, you know what? God discovered that in my weakness, I am made strong. He concludes verses 18 through 22 of chapter 10 with the same argument he started with. It would have been better if I was never born. If God made me just to pick on me. And let me tell you, God has the resources to pick on you. You think God's picked on you, you don't know the beginning of being picked on because God could always make it worse. I don't care how bad you think God has picked on you, He could always up the ante. He could always make it worse. When I was a young man in the Navy, I thought God could pick on me then, but He couldn't. Once I became a dad, then I found out that God could touch my children. And then when I got older, I became a grandparent. I realized that now that God can reach down and touch my grandkids. See, God lets you grow and grow and grow. And really, if that were true, if he created me just to condemn me, he keeps letting us live just so he's got more stuff to take away. We got more reason to fear him. Except, except, we got all those promises that Jesus one thing Job didn't have, if only I had a mediator. Somebody who could stand next to me and be God's equal. And keep God, as it were, off my back. And so we have the blood of Jesus, which washed away all our sins. And so that when the Father sees me and sees my wickedness, He doesn't look at that. He sees instead in me, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is, for me, the hope of glory. And so when the Father sees me, he only sees his perfect Son. Because, unlike Job, I do have a mediator. And my defense is not, why are you treating me so bad? My defense is, why does God love me so? Why would God give up his Son for me? Why does God love me so on my worst day, the worst days of my life, I could always ask myself, why does God love me that much? Good and bad come to everybody. I'm not all that concerned about good and bad because it's just part of life. But unlike Job, I can always ask the question, why does God love me so? Mom and I always argue that we have probably been two of God's most spoiled children. We have always been favored by God. Good, bad, we look at our life and we say, we've always been special to God. It just seems that way to us. That we've always been special to God. And maybe it's because God's always been special to us. Why did you create me just to pick on me? No. I could never say like Job, it would have been better if I was never born. Because not that I was born once, but my success comes in the fact that I've been born twice. You must be born again. And after being born again, I have now received all the blessing, all the promise, all the good that God has promised to those perfect people who make it to heaven. Because my perfection doesn't lie in me. My perfection is found in Jesus. Who, even his accusers, had to confess that in him there was no fault. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. The thief at the cross said, not, he's not like us. This man has done nothing wrong. And the Roman soldier who stood at the cross said, surely this was 
a just man, or surely this was the Son of God. And so the Son of God who died for me and gave me new life has allowed me to never have to utter those words. It would be better if I was never born. I always say I'm glad I was born, but how much gladder I am that I was born a second time into the kingdom of heaven. How glad I am that I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my savior. And from that very day that I uttered that prayer to this, I've never been sorry. I've always been glad. And I've always known that Jesus loves me. And that's something Job did not know. And too bad. I feel sorry for him. Because he couldn't know what you and I get to know. That Jesus loves us all the time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this chance to look at Job's life. And Father, to look at what he prayed for. A mediator. And Father, to know that we have that mediator. Our Lord Jesus is our mediator. He stands before you. He stands with us. And he says, Father, look at my blood. I've paid for that sin. Look at my blood and answer that prayer. Look at my blood and give them what they have need of. And so, Father, we have a mediator and we say thank you for it. Thank you, Father, for your mercy, your grace, and your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. In his holy name we pray, thanking you. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Appreciate you coming out. And uh, trust those girls will sing for us on Sunday morning.